All right, good morning, everyone. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> you all just sort of descend into the distance, which is actually kind of cool. I don't know if you can see it as well. This stage actually hangs on chains, so you can, you can rock it, which is really good if you've been out too late last night, which is not me because I knew I had to do this thing. This is a really different talk for me because it's, it's not about hacking sort of computer things and physical things. And I normally do the, you know, like the SQL injection and the Wi-Fi stuff, which is really good. But this is uh, one of these sort of soft skills talks, right? More, <laughs> there's a wall. So more about uh, sort of the things that, that I've done to allow me to, to get to, to where I am and, you know, like literally where I am here in Norway and be able to do the things I do today. And a lot of it's about the experiences I had as I left the corporate world. Now, I was working for these guys. I spent 14 years uh, at Pfizer. And for those of you who don't know what Pfizer is, well, you at least not Viagra is, right? No. <laughs> no? OK. Check your junk mail. It's in there. Now, you might sort of think of Viagra and go, well, you know, like the office must have been a lot of fun, right? <laughs> the whole time, we would have been uh, proverbially flicking the light switches. But there's a whole bunch of things that, that sort of went on that, that drove me to where I am now. And, and one of the, I guess, the first catalysts for creating kind of a, an independent life, and, and to be clear as well, this talk is not about how to go out and be independent. It's about how to be happier and more productive as developers, how to do your job better, how to make your companies happier as well. And one of the things that may inevitably occur as a result of that is you get some more choices in life. So I started a blog. And this was, this was almost eight years ago now. And the very first blog post that I wrote was this one. Why online identities are smart career moves. And I sort of had this theory. And these are sort of quotes from the original blog post. I thought, look, one of the best things you can do to make yourself more marketable is to have an active online profile. And part of the reason that I was sort of forming these conclusions is that I was interviewing people in my old job. And they'd come along and they'd, they'd do the normal interviewee thing. They'd give you your, their, their CV. And everything on the CV says, I'm awesome. <laughs> you're like, well, of course you are. You wrote it. You're going to say you're awesome. And then they go, no, 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 like, go and speak to my references. But you chose them. <laughs> of course they're going to say that you're awesome. You're going to pick references that do that. And we all do this, right? This is how you market yourself. This is how you do CVs and job interviews. And even when you look at LinkedIn, and you look at all the endorsements and references and things, everyone's saying that you're awesome because you build this profile of people who have a, a vested interest, perhaps because they're friends, of saying how great you are. What I wanted to do is sort of be able to more go towards the point of saying that rather than just telling other people that you're awesome at what you do, let's show, let's demonstrate. And at the time, back in 2009, it wasn't that I was looking to change my job. I didn't want to get out of there and go and do something else. I didn't want to work for another company, didn't want to be independent. But the theory I had at the time is that at some point in the future, I might. Now, that might be my choice, might be their choice. And as it turned out, it took about five years before I hated my job, and it took about another year after that before the job was gone. And this will sort of take you through how that happened. So I used to work out here, and this is, this is a sort of a typical semi-industrial site out in Australia. And I'd drive out here each day, and I'd go to my office. And I had an office just there, and it was in the basement. It was right down the bottom. And it was in the middle. So it looked like this. Now, I didn't get to have windows. Windows are a privilege. My boss had windows. He was never there. I'm not quite sure why he needed the windows, but it was important to reflect his stature by having an office with windows. And this was sort of, I guess it's like this in many places, right? There is a perceived hierarchy. And as you go through this hierarchy, you've got to be able to demonstrate that you have achieved this level by having the fruits of that labor. So the, the office with the window and the car space with the number and the roof and all this other sort of stuff that frankly didn't rub me up the right way. So that was how it was. And, and to fast forward to where it is now, and then we'll kind of talk about the journey. I have a lot more light in my current office, which is quite nice. My co-workers are much nicer too, some of them. 
Some of them are actually much better developers than the old ones. <laughs> and I go here on my jet ski and I take my laptop and then I go home. And every time I go home, I'm enormously excited as I arrive on the jet ski. <laughs> Normally a lot more tanned when I'm in Australia. But I do go home on the jet ski. And the thing about the jet ski is that you never see anyone on a jet ski who's unhappy. Right? Like, everyone is always smiling. Google it. You will not find an unhappy person on a jet ski. And when I go home, I go down here, and, and this, is, this is where we live. This is our, our street. This is a, <laughs> a Gold Coast Australia street. And this is not a fabricated photo, too. I know it looks like it's out of a game, but it's just like iPhone. Here you go. And then we go home to our house, and this is where we live now. And there's a little garage behind the, the jetty there, and the, there's a ramp comes down, and then the jet ski goes on there, and you park the jet ski. And I'm showing this because I want to try and show, as I go through this, how significant a change occurred because of the things that I'm going to talk about. And I didn't want to sort of say, go and do all this stuff and maybe something nice will happen. I wanted to be quite clear about it, but I'm also really conscious that in Norway we have this. Now, I could read this to you, but I think most of you know what it means. For those of you who are not Norwegian and are unfamiliar with this, this is actually a Danish guy called Axel Sandemos. And he wrote back in the early 30s about Juntelöven. So Norwegians, you guys know what Juntelöven is, yeah? yeah? All right. For non-Norwegians, if he was Australian, it would be tall poppy syndrome. And basically the premise here is, is resentment of the success of someone else. And it's, it's, I guess it's being conscious that when you, you show successful things and you show life being good, other people will potentially resent that. So I'm going to be very conscious of that as I go through this. And again, I want to talk not just about money sides of things as well, but other things that you can do to make your life a lot happier. And really, a, a lot of this comes down to the opportunities that you want to make. And I'm going to have a few sort of quotes like this, which I think are kind of pertinent for all of us in our careers, especially those of us working as developers as I was. When I talk about opportunities, it's not just about the money. Now, obviously, that's something important. And inevitably, that's the reason many of us are working in the first place, right? I'm sure if we could choose to do whatever we want and the money wasn't a factor, we would probably do different things. So when there is that opportunity, that's important, very important to a lot of people. How happy you are with what you do is also enormously important. <laughs> there are some shit jobs out there, let's be honest. <laughs> And this is almost sort of a metaphor, I think, for the way many of us have probably felt in our work lives, particularly in our corporate lives. And having the choices to be able to say, maybe I want to go and do something different. Maybe this isn't the role for me. And in terms of making opportunities for yourself, for many people, it comes back to family. So do I want to have more time with my family? Do I want to have more flexibility? Do I want to spend less time in the office? So all of these things are different motivators for different people, and I appreciate that everyone has different things that are important to them at different levels. So where it really started for me is what I mentioned earlier on with the blog. And I really think that blogging was, was such a sort of pivotal way to start getting exposure and such a good platform because it's something very, very easy to start on, and it's something that you can build very, very large. And I actually think that if anyone's considering this, talking to your boss about blogging is a really good thing. And I, I want to sort of talk about why this is such a productive way of working. So one of the things that, that I found in a corporate environment is that you're always working with people who are a little bit of an echo chamber to some degree. So they've got the same interest. A lot of them are hired with the same skill sets. Depending on where you are, you may even be much better at some areas of technology than the other people you work with. Pfizer was divesting a lot of its technical resources, and I was one of very few people that were left. So it was hard for me to go and have discussions with people about architecture or coding or security or any of these sorts of things. And I'd find that, that I would implement something. So I'd come up with an idea. So for example, here's how we're going to do source control. And everyone would go, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, <laughs> Are you saying it's awesome because you really understand it and you think it's awesome, or are you saying it's awesome because you're being polite? 
And that's the other thing that happens in a, a corporate environment. Everyone has a level of politeness, which, which you kind of need to have, right? Because you work with each other. When you write blog posts and you put them on the internet, a lot of people aren't so polite. I'm going to give you some examples of that later. But in a more sort of constructive manner, I, I guess what I mean by that is that there are a lot of people out there that are willing to tell you when you're wrong or that there's a better way of doing it. And when you write about anything on the internet, chances are you're not going to be the smartest person in the room. There's going to be a lot of other people that understand this thing better than you and have thought about it much longer than you. And that's definitely still the case for me today as well. So one of the great things about writing and putting it online is the amount of feedback that you get that make what you're doing better than if you just sat there in isolation. And this is one of the value propositions for the boss as well, right? I want to write a blog because I want to get more information about how I'm doing this. The other thing I found is that when I wrote blogs, so for example, this one on Team City, this was in 2010, I wrote a, a five-part blog series, and, and when I wrote this, I was actually rolling out Team City, continuous integration in Pfizer, and I had no idea what I was doing. But I went and researched it and wrote it down very, very precisely because I wanted to get all my facts right, because if I didn't get them right, there would be someone on the internet telling me I was an idiot, and I don't like getting feedback like that. So I wrote it out very, very carefully, five-part series, and I got wonderful feedback from people. Lots of people said, hey, this is awesome, this is really useful, and you can still go to this day and read this series and read all the comments that actually contributed to that post. A lot of the gold in these posts is often from other people. Now, this also served multiple purposes because as I was writing this out and trying to get all of my facts straight and understand it to a depth that I never would have done if it was just me doing it for Pfizer, I was also creating documentation. And when I left the organisation eventually and people said, where's the documentation for Team City? It's like www.troyhunt forward slash and this is how I built it and configured it. There are a few other internal things obviously, but that was the main part. I had lots of experiences like this, so things like PowerShell and Azure and automation. And we were moving a lot of things from traditional hosting into Azure. And what I started to do is to use the time I had in the office to write about stuff like this. Now, I felt no conflict of interest because I was sitting there in the office trying to figure out how do I explain this to other people? How do I get all my facts right? How do I get this spot on? And when I was doing that, by writing it on a blog post, again, I was held to higher account than what I ever would be if I just did it internally. Now, blog posts like this are my reference as well, so I go back to this now when I need to remember how to do it. I literally Google, Troy Hunt, Azure PowerShell, and I go back to my own blog post so I can remember what I was doing. Now, the great thing about working like this is that it also gives you enormous amounts of leverage. And what I mean by that is that rather than me just sitting there in isolation, doing my job in Pfizer and impacting this one organisation and those people around me, when I write blog posts like those, there's people everywhere that get use out of it. And not only that, but it builds my profile and I become known as the guy that did the Team City thing. And now there's a lot of references out there to Troy Hunt and continuous integration or Troy Hunt doing the Azure thing. So I've used that one piece of time not just to do my job and do it much better than what I would have otherwise, but to also build my individual presence and my individual brand. And I was thinking, if someone else later on comes along and says, I want to hire Troy, and I go out there with a CV which says I'm awesome, and references that say I'm awesome, they can go and read stuff like that and see what I was actually doing, not just me telling them. Now, if you want to start blogging, you can get into something like Ghost. And Ghost is a really great blogging platform. I ran on Blogger for years, Google Blogger, and basically they just didn't change the platform, they didn't evolve. And I moved to Ghost earlier last year. And you can go and get that either for free and then run it on your own VPS, stand it up on Azure or something like that, or you can go and run it on their hosted platform. 62 cents a day, 19 bucks a month. And I would recommend doing this. A lot of people sort of go, oh, you know, I want to control it myself, I want to run it on my own environment, I want to be a server admin. You've got to decide, like, do you want to be a server admin or, or do you want to write blogs? So I'd highly recommend this. The other thing is go and get Cloudflare. 
And you can wrap Cloudflare around your ghost blog and you can get HTTPS because you get the padlock. Apparently the padlock is important these days. So you get that and you get a globally distributed CDN and a whole bunch of other nifty things. And the best bit about that one is free. So these are really good starting points. And the other thing that I'd add to that is go and get a template. So there's all these ghost templates out there. Some of them are free, some of them are 10 or 20 bucks. Go and get that, install it, and it's not going to be perfect and it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you can get started. You can start writing stuff, start creating things. And then you might go, okay, well, what am I going to write? <laughs> like, I don't know, where do I start? And to be honest, it, it kind of doesn't matter so long as you do something, so long as you start somewhere. So you saw the first blog post I wrote earlier. The second one was around subversion. So this was what we used to do for source control before everyone went to Git. Examples of Visual Studio 2010 and .NET 4. I was just pulling stuff, consolidating things from various places I saw and going, let's just put it in one place where I think it's interesting. I wouldn't recommend this one on retrospect. <laughs> this has many other legacy dependencies you'll have to deal with for a long time. But I was writing, okay? I was putting stuff down and I was finding my way, finding out what I wanted to do. And I went on and did a lot more of this sort of stuff. This was the first time I did any sort of smackdown of a company. And believe me, I was kind of nervous after I put it out there because I basically went, Virgin Blue is doing a bunch of shit stuff. I hope I don't get into trouble from Virgin Blue. Or my boss. But I don't know that my boss was actually reading my blog post. So as I went along, I was just putting stuff out there. The PDC conference, Professional Developers Conference, back in 2009. And again, like Visual Studio, this was just, let's get a bunch of things together in one place. I rebuilt my home office. This was basically just buying computer screens and a couple of other things that many of you already do. But when I started to write about this stuff, I started to get an audience. I started to get comfortable with the blogging. And the interesting thing is that none of this is about security, right? Like none of these blog posts here, or the first one, has got anything to do with security. And it kind of took me a while of doing this before I started to drift in that direction. So the real point here is not to sort of feel that you have to have a goal or a niche to begin with. You just begin and then things evolve. Now beyond blogging, you can write in many other places as well. So I was writing on Redgate Simple Talk for quite a bit. This is free, you don't make any money from this. But this was around versioning. CI for databases. Shared development databases. And again, none of this has got anything at all to do with security, but this was increasing exposure, figuring out what I liked, what I enjoyed. Now some of you might then say, okay, well, what if the boss comes along and the boss is a bit worried? Okay, because the boss is thinking, is this going to be a problem? Now, if you work with a boss like this, first of all, <laughs> if, if your boss is concerned about you getting too good at what you do, now whether that be because you do blogging or whether it's because you go and do extra training or you invest your personal time, and let's be clear, the vast majority of effort that went into this blog was still personal time. If this is where you are, that is probably a sign that it's not a very healthy environment. So you really need to think seriously about that. Now that was blogging, and inevitably the, the next thing that came along uh, was the speaking. And this is the first ever talk I ever did. I managed to find it online the other day. And I did this for, for SSW in Australia. Some of you might know Adam Kogan. He's here this week as well. He runs SSW. And he asked me along to do this user group talk. And this was in 2012, early 2012. And I look back at it now, and it's, it, it's what you would expect to see of your first talk when you hadn't really practiced much and you're kind of figuring it all out. But it, it's a, it was a starting point. And that kind of led through eventually to things like the opening keynote here last year. But I only got to do that because I did these tiny little things. That previous slide was walking distance from my house. This event is like 30 hours on aeroplanes and airports. You know, the other, so this is sort of the big stage. But they build up to it. And the speaking is enormously valuable because it starts to certainly initially put you out of your comfort zone. You know, a lot of speakers get very nervous about doing this. There's a lot of preparation and consternation and everyone's stressed about what's going to happen. 
but it really, really makes you focus on what you're doing. And of course, it's, it's great exposure. And that's, that's why myself and all the other speakers are here this week as well. It's, it's great exposure in terms of other people seeing who you are, but it's great exposure to other people too. And you know, I hope everyone's getting that out of this week, where you're meeting people and making connections. And all of that is really useful for your job. So again, putting it back to this isn't just about leaving your place of work. You're here because many of the things that you see here and the connections you make will help you do your job better. Now, if you want to get involved in speaking, there are a lot of calls for papers. So for example, you could speak at NDC London in January. Call for paper for that is open right now. You can go over there and say, hey, I've got a good idea. I'd like to talk about a thing. It might be a database thing or a web thing. It might be a soft skills thing. It might be something totally different. You can go and submit that call for paper. You just need a title and an abstract, a couple of paragraphs, and explain why you think it's awesome. And you may well get in. Probably about six months from now, there'll be a call for paper for NDC 2018. And particularly for those of you who are local, you have an advantage. Because conferences like NDC, they do want to have a lot of local representation. So if you're thinking about this, you've got about six months before you've got to come up with a good idea and then submit it for NDC 2018. Now, the other thing that I still do a lot of is I do a lot of user groups. And just to be clear, things like user groups and talks like this, we don't make any money from this. There's no speakers getting paid to come and go to the other side of the world and stand on stage. All of this is the connections and the exposure. The user groups are really good because there's so many of them. And this was a user group I did in Denmark earlier this year. And I normally sort of talk for about an hour. So it'll be a talk like this, probably a little bit more casual. And then you sit around and ask or answer questions for an hour and meet people and chat. And these are awesome. And there are lots of user groups wherever you are. I know there's lots of user groups in Norway because I've done two of them already. And some of the other speakers have done other ones. So there's lots of places you can go and say, look, I'd like to maybe go along and have a look at what you're doing, and then I'd like to speak. And the barrier to entry is very, very low. If you've got a good idea, fantastic, because everyone's going along there for free and it's relaxed, a bit of fun. So user groups are really useful. If you want to get speaking without perhaps the, the stage presence and the stage fright and everything that comes along with it, have a think about podcasts as well. So everyone knows these guys, all right? Great, so these guys, are certainly the, uh, the experts when it comes to podcasts. There are a lot of other podcasts out there. A lot of places you can go and speak without having to turn up on a stage. So for example, it's Lars Klintz. Now I, I asked Lars beforehand, Lars is here in the audience, I said, can I put this up here and if anyone has got something that they'd like to talk about on the podcast, can they come and talk to you? And he said, yes. So if you've got an idea or something that you'd like to start getting out there, Go and grab Lars or go and grab me and I'll, I'll point you to Lars. Because this is cool. This gets you speaking and it gets you exposure and it's in a really stress-free kind of way. So, Dane and Payne and Lars. Who's got Stack Overflow accounts? In an audience like this, like you know, it's going to be a lot. Stack Overflow is great because Stack Overflow becomes like a living, breathing history of what you've been doing. And if I'm honest, I haven't spent a lot of time on it in recent years, but there was a period there where I went, Let's just spend a heap of time answering questions. And I'm going to do that to build up my expertise in this area, because when I have to think about it, I get a bit better. And it also means that someone can go along to this page and go, OK, well, what's Troy been up to? So not only here are the questions that Troy's been answering and the things that he obviously understands, but here are the questions I've been asking. And this is one of the things that always sort of struck me in interviews. I'd, I'd say to the, the candidates, you know, like you get, you get stuck on something, what do you do? And really, most of them would just blow a heap of time on Google, searching for stuff. And they, they were always sort of reticent to go out there and put questions out there online, because when you do this, you, you're telling people what you don't know. And people are worried about that. But it's a great record, right? It's a great record of saying, look, I've been involved in these things and I'm comfortable enough to say there are things I don't know. And you can go to my profile and see all the things I didn't know. Now, sometimes there are also no answers as well. And there's quite a few of those where people just went, oh, well, maybe there's not a way to do that. But it's great. And you can see up the top right there the impact. 861,000 people reached. Now, I've only got 13,500 odd reputation. There's probably a lot of people in this room that have got more. But there's 861,000 people that I've been able to reach, even if it's just a little bit. 
And then when they see that in conjunction with things like the blog and the speaking, it kind of starts to build your image and your reputation. Doing projects is another one. So there's, there's a lot of ways of getting involved in writing software. And I'm talking about writing software independently of your career uh, and for the betterment of society and for public use. So this was a project that I built back in 2011. Automated security analyzer phrase Pit.net websites. And this was, if anything, this was probably a really good example of the leverage because I was at Pfizer, we're building websites on ASP.net and we'd be putting these websites out there and every single time we did this I'd be going, okay, have you turned on custom errors? Do you have your traces exposed? Or are your Elmer logs out there? And I'd be doing all this manually. And I went, okay, well I'm going to build a project to do this. And it, it's a simple project but it's very effective and it actually saved me quite a bit of time in the office. Wrote most of it at home on my own time because I just wanted to do it, it's kind of fun. But it saved me time in the office, saved a lot of other people time in other places because they started using it, and it built my reputation as that ASP.NET security guy. So again, it's the leverage, right? Like I did this once and it had multiple uses over and over and over again. You learn a lot more when you start to do projects that are publicly facing too. And if you don't want to do your own project, get involved in one of the gazillions of open source projects that are out there, even in just a little way. So I went from that onto this, and I think many people probably now know this one. And this again was a great example of the leverage where I did this one thing, but I used it over and over and over again. So what a lot of people don't know is that the main reason I built Have I Been Pwned was not to search for data breaches, but it was to play with Azure. I wanted to play with the new shiny tech. I wanted to play with table storage and app services and all these sorts of things. And I'm looking around going, what am I going to do? Oh, yeah, that data breach thing, that'll do, you know. Maybe people will like that or do that. And it became massive. But the great thing about that is that it meant that not only did I get the Azure experience, which I took back into Pfizer and used to do the sorts of things we were doing there. I mentioned we were moving a lot of websites. So it was really useful for that. But of course, it's helped a lot of people. And it's gotten huge amounts of press as well. And the press has then helped me build my identity and build my independence. So this is just sort of another one of these things where by doing this once and using it in many, many different ways, it actually looks like I do a lot more than what I do. And often people are going, like, how do you do all this stuff? And I was like, well, you're actually looking at the same thing multiple times over. I've just leveraged it. Now, inevitably, when you do put things out there online, I'm sure you probably know this, but some people on the internet are dicks. <laughs> Let me give you some examples. Um, now, I mean, let's be fair about this. Some of them are dicks, and some of them just simply have different views, different cultural perspectives. And we're going to look at a bit of both of these, but we might even just start with, with the cultural thing. And a good example of that is there's this little video. And if you saw me talk yesterday afternoon, you would have seen this video. It's only a few seconds. But I want to show it to you again and then talk about some feedback I had. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now, the reason I show this is that it's a guy in a hoodie on a green screen, basically personifying every stereotype people have about hackers. And it's promoting a product by using a freely available website called Hackertyper, hackertyper.net, for those of you who haven't seen it. You go there, you mash the keyboard, green text appears on the screen. Oh, it's so scary, hackers. And I show this because it's kind of hilarious. And I've shown this all over the world. I've probably done this talk where I have this video maybe 20 times. And when I say all over the world, predominantly Europe and Australia, but I did it in Australia, in Brisbane, in December. And a guy came up to me after I did the talk, and he said, uh, this is something about your talk. And I was like, all right, cool, you know, <laughs> how was it? And he liked it, which is great, you know. And the, and the guy was American, and he was obviously traveling there from somewhere else on the other side of the world. And he said, uh, the hacker you just showed. And I'm like, OK. And he was kind of hesitating a little bit. And I'm going, what, what have I done? And he goes, he's black. It's like, shit, was he? 
I didn't realize. <laughs> I just, like I just got the video and I put it in the video. And then I looked at the talk afterwards. And the other hacker was white. And that hacker was white. And that hacker was white. And I don't know what that one was because he had a mask. And that one was a bear. <laughs> but, but what the guy, his perspective was coming from America, there is, there is the negative connotation of if you associate race and crime, you know, things like this can be poorly received. And this is not something that, that, that happens in Australia in terms of at least the strength of that perception. Uh, and I haven't seen it anywhere else as well. But I, after he said it, I was like, oh, yeah, the US. You know, like I hadn't really thought about that. And this is the reality. When you put stuff out there that faces the world, you end up spanning all of these different cultures and you're going to piss some people off. And I was seeing this sort of over and over again in different contexts. So I did this blog post a few years ago now, which was about doing password resets. And what I was trying to say within this blog post, and it's one of my usual <laughs> multi-thousand word posts because I wanted to be detailed, is I said, look, when you do a password reset, it's really important not to confirm whether the email address exists on the site or not, because this is an enumeration risk. It can tell other people whether someone has an account there. And particularly on certain sites like this one, that's a bad thing. And I had to crop a lot of images out of this screen cap in order to get it to the point where I thought it was suitable to put on my blog. And I eventually sort of distilled it down to the point where I went, OK, there are three girls. This is beach-style clothing. It's you know, no nudity per se. This will be fine. And of course, inevitably, I had feedback from a couple of people, again, from mostly from the US, because I think they're a little bit more culturally sensitive in parts there. Europe tends to be a lot more progressive in that way. And they kind of said, you know, look, if, if my boss walks past, I'm going to get in trouble. And I was like, look, if your boss walks past, they're going to see flow diagrams and walls and walls of text and one little image, but don't worry about it. I hadn't thought about it. So I ended up putting some text further up in a, in a big red box. And I said, look, as you scroll down, there's going to be a screen cap of an adult website. There is nothing that you wouldn't see on the beach. Just in case that would inconvenience you, click here and the image will be replaced by fluffy bunnies. <laughs> the fluffy bunnies are not wearing any clothes. It's actually what I said, because I was just a little pissed about it. I think what I was pissed about is I put all of this effort into building this big thing. Many of these blog posts can take days to write, and I write them over a period of weeks or months. So when someone comes and picks on something like that, uh, it, it, is, it is frustrating. Another one recently, I wrote about Cloudflare. This was just last year. And yeah, this, to me, was a very important blog post. And I had one sentence in there, which was this one. And as you read that now, you can sort of see how maybe, maybe some people from some corners of one country in the world might think maybe not so good. And I had a bit of feedback to that effect. And uh, you know, there was, there was this one. And again, I was sort of pissed that there's all this sort of love and tender care going into a blog post. And the thing that they wanted to talk about is how it made one off-handed political statement. Like, that was the thing that they remembered out of all this other good effort. Someone else left a comment as well, which, which kind of struck me because it's saying, you know, like, you could lose your reputation from one sentence that was a fairly benign, at least in my mind, comment about politics. You know, subscribers could drop off. And then he said, a small part of me died today. I was like, shit. <laughs> you really, really like Trump, don't you? And then I kind of went, well, so what? You know, like, so what if he's upset? Do I have to please everybody all the time? If someone gets offended, does it matter too much? And it's not that you want to go around doing terrible things that we collectively would agree are offensive as a society. But if there's one or two people, does it matter? And I found this great clip. This is an Aussie comedian called Steve Hughes talking about being offended. And political correctness is the oppression of our intellectual movement, so no one says anything anymore in case somebody else gets offended. <laughs> what happens if you say that and someone gets offended? <laughs> well, they can be offended. <laughs> What's wrong with being offended? When did sticks and stones may break my bones stop being relevant? 
Isn't that what you teach children, for God's sake? That's what you teach toddlers. He called me an idiot. Don't worry about him. He's a dick. <laughs> now you have adults going, I was offended. I was offended and I have rights. <laughs> well, so what? Be offended. Nothing happens. <laughs> You're an adult. Grow up. Deal with it. I was offended. I don't care. Nothing happens when you're offended. There's nothing. I, I went to the comedy show and, and the comedian said something about the Lord and, and I was offended. And when I woke up in the morning, I had leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true, right? Like, nothing happens. And the reality of it is, and, and this is sort of the, the thing that you need to get to grips with, is that you need to offend some people. Because if you try so hard not to offend anyone, you're going to lose all of your personality it's going to become so bland so boring and there's just no possible way particularly on the internet where some people just about have a job of being offended it's just impossible to put stuff out there and not piss some people off but it's confronting right particularly when people get offended enough to start doing stuff like this <laughs> so this is a discuss account dedicated to how much i suck Behind that, you can see a WordPress site. That's troyhuntsucks.wordpress.com. Someone actually made a blog dedicated to how much I suck. And they wrote many blog posts. And unfortunately, they're no longer available. And I couldn't even find them on archive.org. And I know it's weird me saying I'm upset. I can't find the things where people are getting offended and angry at me. But some of them were hilarious. I do have others, though. I'm going to show you. So this person devoted time to doing this. And I thought... Shit, there could be people out there who really do think I suck. I need to go and register TroyHuntSucks.com and clear things up. <laughs> and this is real. This exists. You can go there now and you can see very clearly I don't. Now, I talk about leverage, right? Like using things over and over again. And I was conscious that every time I register a domain, without paying for who is privacy, so my contact details are on there, I don't know if this happens here as well, but I start getting calls from India trying to sell me web development services, which is always a funny conversation. But I thought, OK, I'll do this, and then I'll see how many times I can make them say Troy Hunt sucks. TroyHuntSucks.com. T-R-O by Troy Hunt, H-U-N-T, Hunt Sucks. S-U-C-K-S dot com. TroyHuntSucks.com. T-R-O by Troy. Uh -huh. Then hunt, H-U-N-T, hunt. Gotcha. Then sucks, S-U-C-K-S.com. Right. Troy Hunt. Yeah. Then sucks, S-U-C-K-S. T-R-O-Y, Troy. Uh -huh. H-U-N-T, hunt, that's your name, Troy Hunt. And then sucks, it's S-U-C-K-S, sucks. Now, look, look, this is endless entertainment, trust me. <laughs> and I would happily just go and register the weirdest domains to get calls like that from people that are very, very close to scammers trying to sell me stuff I don't need. But all of this abuse is kind of... It, in a way, it's a little bit benign, it's a little bit childish. But there are times when it does get serious and it, it, does, get, it does get pretty direct. And this, this kind of brings us to a bit of a crossroads. Who wants to see the censored version? Who wants to see the uncensored version? That's just as well, because that's all I've got. <laughs> all right, so sometimes people get very direct. And I thought, I'll show you one piece of feedback. And this, this is normally what, for years, I've been showing friends as we drink beer and we laugh. Because, well, well, I'll just read it. It's like we all need beers right now, just to, just to read and enjoy the glory of this. And of course, the irony of it is I'm here on the other side of the world in front of hundreds of people showing my useless face at another conference. So obviously, I didn't take it particularly seriously. And to be fair, like this is one level of abuse. And there is other abuse out there, particularly directed at women in this industry, which is just unfathomably worse than this. But imagine how you feel when you do get stuff like that, you know, and this I won't go into the details, but this was triggered off by something very, very benign, and someone obviously got a bee in their bonnet about it, got very upset. And you do have to prepare that, that as you sort of go along and you, and you build more momentum and you're exposed to more people, 
that sort of tiny percentage of people ends up being a larger individual number and you get stuff like this. But I don't want that to sort of make things seem negative either because I have a huge number of positive experiences online and particularly things like social media have been enormously valuable and I do a lot through Twitter. That's sort of the, the, the avenue which I seem to get the most engagement from. And as much as I get some bad abuse like the other one, that is so exceptional. And the norm is more stuff like this. And these are all people that I've met virtually on Twitter and then gone to events and met in person. And it, it still strikes me as, as a weird thing when people come up and they go, oh, can I get a selfie? And I'm like, with me? Yeah, OK, sure. And what I love about this is everyone there looks so happy. And it's not just them, but I look happy too because this is fun. I enjoy doing this. And sometimes when I go to somewhere new, I'll, uh, I'll just tweet out, you know, something random. Hey, I'm, I'm going to be in a place. You know, do you want to go and get a coffee? And initially I was like, are people going to be like weird stalkers? Or, you know, like who am I actually going to meet here? But it's always gone really, really well. And, and this was in Belgium earlier this year. And uh, I met this guy down here, a bloke called Stein. And uh, he said, you know, I'll show you around Antwerp, which was nice. And he brought me the world's best beer, which was very nice. And he sort of gives this to me. He goes, you know, here's the world's best beer. So everyone says that about their beer. But I looked it up, and it was. It's the world's best beer, apparently. West Flatron. It was even better than that, because he gave me two of the world's best beer, of which one remains. But this was like just a chance encounter. Yeah, I'm literally on the train. Huh, I'm going to Antwerp. Does anyone want to catch up? So the, the social media side of things, as much as people say it's virtual, it's not real, it's online, it leads to engagements like this, and it leads to people that are interested in connections. And thinking about bringing that back to your workplace and your career as well, this is really useful to be able to meet all of these people in the industry and to have people you can call on. And what I always tried to tell people in Pfizer, and I don't think a lot of people got this, is that those connections and those ability to reach out to people is enormously valuable. You pay a lot of money to consultants and companies to be able to talk to the sorts of people you can just meet online for free. Now, inevitably, while you're online, you're going to find that you can also be polarizing. We've established how not everyone's going to be happy all the time. And recently, we got a new car. And uh, I posted a little video clip. It was a little sound of the engine, because it sounds epic. And I've posted this online, and someone's come back with this. And as best I could tell, what they were wanting me to do is to tailor my Twitter feed, not to the 73,000 other followers, but to them. You know, like, can we just keep it exclusively on security? And again, like, I see this and I get frustrated, but by the same token, someone else pops up and goes, well, this is why I like you. <laughs> You're always going to find this polarizing set of views. But th there's an interesting thing that happens on Twitter, which is that it, it gives you other opportunities to demonstrate who you are. And I'll give you an example of that. I recently got a, a new machine from Lenovo, a Yoga 910. And I was curious. I, I went home and I plugged it into the network. I thought, OK, brand new machine. How much stuff is it going to download? Because this is just like a geeky, interesting thing. And then I put out a tweet. So I would plugged it in, and it pulled down 12 gigabytes worth of data. And I had a screen cap showing the, the sessions on my local network that it used. And I said, stats via UBNT. This is ubiquity. I put a bunch of ubiquity stuff in my house recently, wrote a few blog posts about it, and I thought, oh, I better actually show where these stats come from. Because every time I show something like this and I don't explain it, I get a heap of replies and they go, where's this from? And this person got quite upset about that. I'm sort of going, OK thrown down my Twitter feed, it's like three words, <laughs> you know, like, what are you upset about? And I was, I was kind of pissed about this. And I was very tempted to sort of go back and go, mate, you're a dickhead, you know, like, <laughs> get real. But I thought, yeah, let's try something different. And I said this. And just so he knew that I wasn't trying to take the piss out of him and I wasn't trying to make a joke, I put a smiley face. <laughs> it was fun. But here's what happened after that. And this was really cool. And this person does still follow me today. I checked before I came and did the talk. 
And it just kind of made me think that there are all these points where you have these opportunities for conflict, and there's like this crossroads, right? And you can go down this one path and say, mate, you know, you're a dick, it's my Twitter timeline, I can put whatever I want, piss off. Or you can do something like this. And now think about what this means in terms of building your exposure. Because if someone comes along and reads your profile later on, they get to see stuff like that. Have you ever read through someone's profile on Twitter or Facebook? You might have seen them being a bit ranty or something. And then you read through their timeline and you, you kind of form this opinion of who the person is and what they stand for. And sometimes it's a very negative opinion because you see the way they're behaving. But it can go the other way as well. So you can create these positive impressions of what you do. And this is not a fabrication, right? It's not like you're trying to be fake. It's being conscious that you have this opportunity to demonstrate your character, which is kind of cool. So I guess starting to sort of move back towards the Pfizer side of things. You know, I'd been doing all of the things that we just spoke about here. And as time went by, they got very much into this space, outsourcing. And I suspect many of you have sort of been through this in your companies because you're in a part of the world that's expensive and you're in an industry which is often outsourced to other companies. Uh, where were we? Other countries. And the, the rationale that, that Pfizer had was pretty much when, OK, we've got these guys. Like, we have got people in sales and marketing, and they make the money. <laughs> I think some of you see where I'm going here. OK, so making money. These guys are great. But then we've got these guys. People like you and I, we cost money. We are an expense. And I don't have to ask for a show of hands because I know many of you are going, yeah, you know, I feel this. Because this is what happens in our industry. Often technology is seen as a cost. And I was seeing this more and more. I was seeing this from the divestiture of technical people. Contracts weren't renewed. There were a number of redundancies. People were going. And I'd see it every day in, in the way people were treated as well. So a perfect example, salespeople, that's where they'd go for a sales conference. Well, it's nice, right? I'd be happy to go there for a holiday, let alone for a work event. This is Hamilton Island up in Great Barrier Reef in Australia. The technology people, we went to the local bowls club down the road. But we did have a budget of $20 a head for the Christmas party. Now, that doesn't buy much more beer in Australia than what it would in Norway, but it doesn't go very far. And this was the way technology was being valued. Then in 2014, I got a new boss. And this boss was in the Philippines. So you're always going to have a bit of a cultural divide. And particularly, a lot of Asian cultures are very hierarchical. They also have communication that's very, they call it very high context, very implicit. Whereas in Australia, we're much more, I guess, we're much more straightforward. We're much more direct. And I think most of Europe is like this as well. So there's always going to be a bit of cultural conflict. But uh, I got this new boss, and before I started reporting to him, I said, look, uh, I'm going over to New Zealand in April to talk about Code Mania. I'm going to the Code Mania conference. I'm going to go and talk there, and then I'm going to have a holiday with my wife because we've been working hard, we want a bit of a break. Yeah, OK, fine. And then at one point, he said, uh, I actually want you to come to the Philippines then. So well. You know, I can't, because I'm going to here. And then he said, no, I'd really, really like you to. It's like, yeah, but you know, I can't, because I've made commitments. People have bought tickets to this event, in part because they know that I'm going to be there and I'm going to speak, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to let people down. Plus, I kind of want to have a holiday with my wife. So he, he replied, and his exact words were, only priority is the company. And you, you sort of get to that point and go, OK, well, your objectives are clearly not aligned with my objectives. And all of the work that a company like Pfizer puts into talking about work-life balance or blend or whatever it is, recognition that people have got to be happy in their jobs, just goes out the window when you say something like that. And I was just getting to the point there in, in April 2014 where every time I went to work, it was feeling like this. It's a really awkward spot to pause on as well. <laughs> 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 
But like this will probably resonate with many people. And hopefully this is not your job now. Maybe it's been your job in the past where you've gone there and every day it has just felt like being kicked in the nuts. And that's what it was beginning to feel like. And I went, okay, well, look, you know, I've, I've got to get out of this place. I've got to make a change. So what I started doing, I'd already been doing the blogging and the speaking and everything in degrees. And I just ramped it up to 11. So I was saying yes to absolutely everything. And I, I vividly recall being in the office, having this image in my mind. This is Jim Carrey from Yes Man. So if you haven't seen the movie, it's where he just says yes to everything, even the craziest stuff. And all of these wonderful things happen. So people are going, can you go here and do a webcast? Yeah, all this is free, right? Yes, I can do that. Can you go and speak there? Yes, I'll do that. This user group, this blog post, this guest blog post. And I was going yes to everything. And just working nonstop. So nights, weekends, everything. On the basis of, of what I'd already done. So I had a, a platform by the time my job got very unhappy. And of course, one of the things I was doing a lot of was, was Pluralsight. And I was writing a lot of courses. I'd written several already. I'd started that in 2012. But when I started ramping it up and building a lot more stuff, by the time I got to September that year, so this was only just after April, five months later, it was actually making more money than Pfizer. And this is great. You can go online and build courses, and if you get enough people watching them, you can make more money than going into work and feeling like you're getting hit in the nuts all day. So this was great. And it sort of then led my wife, Kylie, and I to, to this discussion of, OK, well, can we go? Can we leave the company? And the problem then is you're going, yeah, I can, but then like half my income goes. You know, because it's like we could go back to where we were before financially, which is great, but you kind of... So we, we talked it over, and we were talking it over late 2014, very early 2015. And I went back into the office, and I had a meeting request. Updates. You ever get one of these, and you're like, oh, that's, that's curious. And you look at the attendee list, and you go, that's an interesting set of people to have in one meeting. And I go to the meeting, and the, the most senior person in the technology department there was a lady and she was crying. This is more interesting. And we're in a conference room and my boss, who's in the Philippines at the time, is on, on the phone. And they go, uh, so here's the org chart now. And there's names. Here's the org chart in the future. And there's no names. And there's less boxes. And there's, there's people in the room and they go, oh shit. And there were people that were very, very worried. Because for them, when this was happening, it was going to be a very negative thing on their lives. They weren't ready, weren't prepared for something like this to happen. And of course, the inevitable did happen. Sorry to have to bring him out again. Come to PubCon tonight, I will fix everything. But it was better than being fired. There were four of us that were given redundancies. And the beautiful thing about a redundancy is rather than being fired and basically you just get booted out with very little, or leaving and you leave with very little, when you get a redundancy, they have to pay. So everyone was sort of getting very sort of stressed and worried about it and thinking, what is going to happen to my life? And I'm going, well, you know, now that I think about it, maybe not so bad. <laughs> and Pfizer, to their credit, had very, very good redundancy packages. If you'd been there long enough, and I had been there a long time, and I walked out with almost a couple of years' worth of pay, as opposed to if I had left a bit earlier and I, I just would have walked out with just about nothing, but of course all the opportunities for Pluralsight and the rest of it. So it was early 2015, and, and by April when I left, I'd been doing a lot more Pluralsight courses, and now it was here. It's twice as much as my normal job. And suddenly it's only a third of my income that I leave behind, and I get all the redundancy package. So I was enormously happy. And I left in April, went out and got some really nice champagne. I don't remember a lot after that. <laughs> I have photos. I look happy. But I was laughing, right? I was stoked. And the, the really important thing here is that all the bits that I'd done in, in the talk up until now, you know, the blogging and the speaking and everything else, it had made me a lot happier whilst I was there, but it also meant that when I no longer wanted to be there, or more specifically when they no longer wanted me there, I had these choices in life. So now it's very different because I'm in places like this and I, I travel around and do a lot of these talks and workshops and things. 
And it often means that I'm in places like this. This is Copenhagen, and I was there in October. And it's uh, typical European autumn weather. It's my son's birthday, and he's at home on the, on the other side of the world. And this is how we spent his birthday. So I'm you know, literally FaceTiming with him. And it, it kind of makes you think about this other thing as well. And this applies no matter how much effort you want to put above and beyond your normal job, which is that you're putting a price on your family. And a lot of people feel really uncomfortable when I say this to them, like, what price do you want to put on your family? Because they're like, <laughs> my family's priceless. I can't put a price on them. But you're all here. You're not with your families. And next week, you'll probably all go into the office and do your office jobs or do whatever it is you do for work as opposed to spend time with your family. So we all do this every single day. We make choices about what we prioritise when. And the, the trick then is, is to find the right balance. So for me, it means being on the other side of the world doing stuff like this. But then when I go home, I've got all this flexibility. So I'll be down there at the tennis court with my seven-year-old and we'll play tennis and then I'll take him to school and we'll have this quality time together and then I'll pick him up at whenever he finishes, 3.30 in the afternoon. I don't have to be in an office. I've got, got the flexibility. But the price of justifying that is not just the travel, but it's the late nights and the fact that I really don't know when holidays start and finish. I'm often not sure when weekends start and finish because it just becomes like a continuous blur. And the thing is, if, whether you do it to the degree which I'm doing now, the degree which I did eight years ago when I started doing it, you're always going to be taking some of your personal time to do this. There's always going to be something above and beyond your normal, everyday kind of job. So you need support. So this is Kylie. Many of you know Kylie. She's my wife. And she gives me enormous support to help me do what I do so that I can be here and I can do these things. And this is really important because if you don't have this shared vision, Things are not going to end well. It's enormously difficult if your partner is not on the same wavelength and they're not supportive of what you do. So I think this is a very important discussion to have. If you want to go and do even just the little bits of, you know, I'm going to spend more time upstairs on the computer each night or I'm going to spend more time on the weekend when I might have been out with the kids. Making that decision about what the right fit is and making sure that it is actually a shared vision with the people that you're doing this for. Thank you very much. We've got a few minutes. Anyone got questions? Yeah, stretch. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm here. You sort of told people when. Um, you talked about shared vision, but I imagine that goes the other way around. So how, how do you deal with that? You, you talked about having a conversation. How, how did you guys work that out? So you, you're, you're saying um, the shared vision goes both ways. So are you saying, does Kylie have the same shared vision as me? Yeah, so, and I mean, when I say shared vision, it's, it's not always just necessarily that Troy will do a lot of blogging and writing and all this sort of thing. You know, very often it's visions about how, how do we want to live? Where do we want to live? Um, who's going to be taking the, the kids to school? So, you know, it, it works very well where it makes her life a lot easier most of the time, Monday to Friday, when I'm around and I can do kids stuff. And then it's much harder than that, obviously, when I'm away. But this is stuff we discuss. And I, I think shared vision is going to mean something different for everyone. But this is why you've got to have the discussion, you know? Like, you've got to have this open dialogue and be transparent with each other. And there's, if, if you don't have that, like, it's, life is going to be hard. Other questions? All right, well, I think we are done. So thank you very much for that one, and thanks very much for coming.